Hi, I'm Lou Blanga, and welcome to How to Invest, an Investor Play series dedicated to educating you on not just which stocks to buy, but to teach you the ins and outs of some of the unique trends in today's market. In this lesson, I'll be guiding you through what is and how to benefit from growth stock investing. First, let's start with the definition. A growth stock, as the name implies, is a stock of a company that is growing faster than average. The accepted measures of fast and average can vary wildly, but most investors think of growth in terms of individual sectors. And therefore, growth stocks in certain industries are stocks of companies which are growing revenues faster than the average company in that industry. Want to find a growth stock in the technology sector? Well, let's look at the industry average growth rate there. It's about 10%. Now look at Facebook. It's growing revenues at over 20%. Let's look at Alphabet. It's growing revenues at over 20% too. Let's look at Amazon. You guessed it. 20% plus revenue growth. Those are growth stocks in the technology sector because the companies are growing revenues at a faster rate than the industry average. The bottom line? Want to find growth stocks? Look for companies whose revenue growth rates are beating their sector benchmarks. Beyond growing quickly, all growth stocks share five common characteristics. One, they have secular growth market exposure. Two, they often possess industry leadership in those markets. Three, they tend to make and sell great products and or services. Four, they have a history of relentless innovation. And five, they normally feature steeper than normal valuations. Now, keep in mind, not every stock that has these characteristics will succeed. Luck plays a strong role here as well. After all, few expected a plucky Harvard student creating Facebook to unseat MySpace, the, at the time, innovative leader in its industry with a growing valuation and great, great, great products. Unfortunately, I do not have a magic eight ball here. I do not have a crystal ball to see the future. There is no universal right way to pick winning growth stocks. But in my years as a growth stock investor and analyst, I have devised a formula that I find particularly helpful when investing in growth stocks. It's a pretty simple process that involves two elementary steps. One, identify investment megatrends that are unstoppable and will redefine how the world works. Two, within those megatrends, find the most relentlessly innovative companies that will dominate the megatrend at scale. Megatrends, innovation, what does all that mean? Let's break it down. Step one, identify investment megatrends that are unstoppable and will redefine how the world works. Think about the rise of e-commerce, the shift toward digital advertising, or the spread of mobile phones. These are investment megatrends that redefine how the world worked over the past two decades. The path wasn't always smooth. Between 2000 and 2020, it seemed like the world stumbled from one crisis to the next, yet through it all, global e-commerce sales rose by 1,269%. North American digital ad sales rose by 1,954%. Mobile phone sales rose by 406%. Sure, these megatrends were slowed somewhat by external noise, but not stopped. And that's the whole point. By investing in secular megatrends, you are investing in unstoppable forces. To be a successful growth stock investor, you need to identify these unstoppable forces at early stages. You need to invest in emerging megatrends before anyone else so that you can get it on the ground floor of the world's biggest investment opportunities. It's on to step two. Find the most relentlessly innovative companies that will dominate the megatrend at scale. Emerging megatrends tend to attract new companies by the boatload. And being part of a megatrend isn't enough to make a growth stock a long-term success. Indeed, most companies in emerging megatrends end up going bust. Just look at the dot-com bubble. 
You see, emerging megatrends eventually and inevitably grow up and mature. As they do, the markets consolidate around a few very strong players. The rest, it's squeezed out. So if you want to be a great growth stock investor, it's not enough to just identify investment megatrends. You have to identify the best companies in that megatrend. And how do you do that? By finding the most innovative companies in the space. Because innovation enables companies to sustain big growth, develop competitive advantages, and turn into market leaders. Among these growth stocks, you may just find the next Amazon, the next Facebook, or the next Apple. The big picture? By investing in the most innovative companies and the most promising hypergrowth megatrends, you will put yourself in a great position to be a great growth stock investor. If you've gotten this far, you're now equipped with the know-how to invest like a professional growth stock investor, but does that mean you should go out and buy a bunch of growth stocks right now? Not necessarily. Allow me to explain. You can either buy value stocks or growth stocks. And deciding between the two comes down to one thing, the cost of equity. The cost of equity takes on many definitions, but with respect to this discussion, the cost of equity wears the hat of the required rate of return on an investment in equity. It's basically the annual rate of return you would require as an investor to be invested in a stock. There are many puts and takes in arriving at the required rate of return, but According to the Capital Asset Pricing Model, otherwise known as CAPM, it can be calculated as follows. The cost of equity equals the risk-free rate plus the equity risk premium, where the risk-free rate acts as a proxy of the return you could get by investing in a risk-free instrument, like the yield on a treasury note. And the equity risk premium is the additional return you require for taking on the risk of investing in a stock. That isn't guaranteed to go up, right? Now, the cost of equity, therefore, oscillates with interest rates and perceived economic health. When interest rates are high and perceived economic health is low, the risk-free rate is high and the equity risk premium is high, resulting in a high cost of equity. On the flip side, when interest rates are low and perceived economic health is high, the risk-free rate is low and the equity risk premium is low, resulting in a low cost of equity. Now, all of this matters because the cost of equity drives stock prices. When the cost of equity is high, the present carries more value than the future, and the value stocks tend to outperform. When the cost of equity is low, the future carries more value, and the growth stocks tend to outperform. It's as simple as that. Buy growth stocks when the cost of equity is low, avoid them when it's high. Of course, the cost of equity isn't the only determinant when it comes to whether you should invest in growth stocks. Technological change matters too, and perhaps much more than the cost of equity even. The world is not static. It is dynamic. Every year, every month even, old technologies fall by the wayside and are replaced by new technologies. Companies align with those new technologies, obviously, grow quickly and turn into growth stocks. Companies align with the old way of doing things, the old technologies fail, and they turn into value stocks. Thus, the pace of technological change matters to growth stock investors. When that pace is really, really fast, growth stocks tend to grow really, really quickly and outperform. On the flip side, when the pace of technological change is slow, growth stocks grow less quickly, and they tend to underperform value stocks. With that said, I'd like to introduce you to a concept that implies that the pace of technological change will never, ever be slow again. The name of the concept? The Law of Accelerating Returns. At its core, the Law of Accelerating Returns is the idea that technological change isn't linear. It's exponential. That is, the rate at which technology changes actually accelerates over time. For example, Technology changes faster today than it did in 2000, and it changed faster in 2000 than it did in 1950. Futurist Ray Kurzweil first coined the term in 1999. At the time, he was simultaneously inspired and awed by the fact that in just a few dozen years, U.S. corporations transformed the concept of a computer 
into a mainstream, widely adopted consumer product. He was similarly enthralled by the internet, which was essentially a science fiction concept in the 1970s, and how one out of every two Americans were using the technology by the turn of the century. After all, it took humans thousands of years to figure out the wheel, stone tools, and fire. Turning computers and the internet into a reality in roughly 30 years was a landmark accomplishment. And yet, by modern standards, that's almost slow. The 21st century has been marked by an unprecedented acceleration in technological change. The iPhone wasn't a thing until 2007, nor was streaming television or cloud computing. Today, less than 15 years later, everyone has an iPhone, every household subscribes to a streaming service, and every enterprise is on the cloud. And the craziest part is, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This acceleration and technological change will only continue over the next decade and beyond. As it does, growth companies aligned with technological change will likely only grow more quickly, which of course has positive implications for growth stocks. You feel ready now, huh? You know all about growth stocks and what makes them tick. You know how to find the best growth stocks. You know when to buy them and when to sell them. Certainly, you're ready to go out there and start investing, right? Almost. Just one more thing. And arguably, this is the most important thing when it comes to investing in growth stocks. You have to ignore the noise. Let's go back to our rationale for why we invest in growth stocks. We noted that investment megatrends like the rise of e-commerce, the shift toward digital advertising, and the spread of mobile phones survived multiple economic and social crises throughout the 2000s and 2010s. Crises such as the dot-com bubble, the 9-11 attacks, the Iraq war, the great financial crisis, the US-China trade war, a global pandemic, and much, much more. Yet, each time every one of those crises emerged, Waves of investors sold e-commerce stocks, sold digital ad stocks, sold mobile phone stocks. Amazon stock crashed during the dot-com bubble. Apple stock plummeted during the great financial crisis. Facebook stock was crushed on the heels of the COVID-19 outbreak. Where do all those stocks trade now? Significantly higher than where they traded even before they crashed. See the point? Every time a major economic or social crisis emerges, investors are tempted to sell everything. Sell first, ask questions later. And that goes for growth stocks. It's human instinct. Yet, growth stock investors almost always regret selling their growth stocks when crises emerge because a few years down the line, those stocks end up trading multiples higher than where they were pre-crash. Thus, if there's one thing I want to leave you with, it's this. To be a successful growth stock investor, learn to ignore the noise and keep your eyes on the prize. It's the only way you will be able to secure consistently large returns over a long time horizon.